Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, June 2nd. We are beginning a new quarter, our summer quarter, uh, for June, July, and August. And the title of this quarter is Covenant in God. Covenant in God. Another word for covenant is promise in God. Um, and Unit 1, the first uh, four lessons of this quarter, is entitled A Fulfilled Covenant. A Fulfilled Covenant, or again, A Fulfilled Promise. From the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly, the lesson title is Making Promises. Making Promises. Our devotional reading is taken from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. Background scripture, Mark chapter 14, verses 12 to 31, and Hebrews chapter 8. Our printed passage or lesson text is Mark chapter 14, verses 17 to 24. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. And then verses 10 to 12. Lesson aims, again from the adult quarterly, or number one, tell how Jesus is the initiator of the new covenant predicted by the prophets and illustrated in the Lord's Supper. Number two, appreciate your standing and relationship with Christ because of the new covenant, or again, the new promise. And then number three, approach the Lord's Supper with greater reverence and awe for the Christ of the New Covenant. The Adult Quarterly has three major divisions after the introduction. The first is the Betrayer, verses 14, chapter 14, verses 7 to 21. The second is the new meaning, I'm sorry, there are four major divisions. The new meaning, covered between verses 22 and 24, Mark 14. The third is the superior covenant, uh, and that's Hebrews 8, 6. And then the new covenant, and that's covered between Hebrews 8, 7 and Hebrews 10 and 12. From the adult, I'm sorry, from the standard commentary, Our lesson title is Jesus Institutes the New Covenant. And additional aims are number one, quote from the memory from memory rather, Jesus' words regarding the bread and cup of the Last Supper. Number two, explain how the lesson texts from Mark and Hebrews interrelate. And then number three, develop a plan to make observance of the Lord's Supper more meaningful. The standard has two major divisions. The first is covenant anticipated, and that's covered between Mark 14, 17 to 25, and the second is covenant described, and that's covered between Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6 and 7, and then 10 to 12. And we're going to uh, read uh, our lesson text uh, in its entirety. But before we do that, uh, as always, uh, we pray before uh, the lesson that, uh, and with, and let's just go before the throne now and ask the Lord, God, we we thank you for another opportunity to study your precious word, and we pray as always, Lord, that you would would give us a clear understanding of your word, Lord. And as we understand your word, the correct interpretation of it, Lord, uh, help us to apply it to our lives, increase our faith and our obedience to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
so before we read our lesson text, let's just uh, spend a, a moment or two talking about uh, covenants, covenants in general, um, and particularly uh, covenants between God and man and God and his chosen people. Uh, we know that uh, the uh, God uh, made a covenant with <clears throat> with Adam uh, before and after the sin. He, he told uh, after the sin, he basically told him that uh, by the sweat of his brows he was going to make his living. Uh, he, in cursing uh, the woman, uh, he said that she would. Uh, uh, bear children in pain and she would be subject to her husband and and uh, and her, her the her seed would uh, bruise the serpent's head the serpent would bruise his heel rather but her seed uh, and we know women don't have seeds speaking of the Christ would bruise the serpent's head uh, then there was of course the Noahic covenant uh, God promised never to destroy the, the earth again uh, by flood, and uh, that the token of that covenant or sign of that covenant was the rainbow. There was the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant with Abraham, which was based on his faith. God promised to bless Abraham, his seed, and multiply his seed, and make him the father of many nations, and through his descendants or his seed, he would bless all the nations of the earth. And all Abraham had to do was to believe God, was to trust God, was to have faith in God. So that was an unconditional covenant that God made with Abraham. Then there was the Mosaic covenant, or the covenant in the law that God gave through Moses, Moses being the principal mediator of that covenant. And uh, we'll we'll talk more about that uh, in just a minute. There was the, David, excuse me, the, the Davidic covenant, in which God made an unconditional promise to King David to bless his descendants, and the principal heir, the principal descendant, would be the Lord Jesus Christ, who would reign and establish his kingdom forever. And, of course, uh, we know that through him all the nations of the world would be blessed. So the promise to Abraham was ultimately accomplished in the uh, in Jesus Christ, the, the son, the uh, fleshly son, if you will, of David. Uh, and then, of course, there was the new covenant uh, spoken of by the prophets, uh, Jeremiah, Isaiah, uh, Zechariah, uh, and others, um, uh, that God uh, is going to say more about, uh, or that we're going to learn more about in this lesson today. And we're actually going to contrast that new covenant, that covenant established by the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, in which he is the mediator of. We're going to compare that to the old Mosaic covenant uh, or the covenant made in the law and, of course, ratified by blood, the sacrifice of animals. We'll talk about that. And then, of course, the ultimate and perfect sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's let's read uh, through our first passage from Mark chapter 14, verses 17 to 25. Uh, and then we'll uh, we'll read through the second passage. Um, verse 17. And in the evening he cometh with the twelve. And as they sat and did eat, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, One of you which eateth with me shall betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and to say unto him one by one, Is it I? And another said, Is it I? And he answered and said unto them, It is the one of the twelve, it is one of the twelve rather, that dippeth with me in the dish. The Son of Man indeed goeth as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good were it for that man if he had never been born. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and brake it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, 
This is my blood of the New Testament or New Covenant or New Promise, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day I drink it in the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus is affirming what the prophets spoke of hundreds of years before this new covenant which God had promised. Uh, he, of course, allowed and there was a purpose for the old covenant. And we'll talk about that as we get further into the lesson. But God had planned a new and better covenant centuries before the first advent of the Lord Jesus. Now, the second passage uh, taken from Hebrew chapter 6, I'm sorry, chapter 8, verse, verses 6, 7, uh, then 10 to 12. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which is established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Skipping down to verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and will write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Our key verse is Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. Now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also... He is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. And let's read that from the uh, <clears throat> from the NIV uh, for a little more clarity. And it says, but in fact, the ministry of Jesus has received uh, uh, has received rather is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. Okay, again, covenant can be interpreted as promises, and we're talking about better promises that this covenant actually uh, is established on. Now, before we go back to Mark 14, uh, beginning at verse 17, let's just give a little background on where we pick up at 17 there. Uh, Jesus has instructed, if we go back to uh, verse 12, we're not going to read all of that, but Jesus has instructed uh, in response to a question from his disciples, uh, where do you plan to eat the Passover? Uh, two of his disciples to go into a near city uh, and to uh, uh, go to the city, and this, uh, this is Jerusalem, and to follow a man carrying water. And that was, uh, uh, he was an easy mark because men didn't generally carry water in those days. And as he entered into the house, they were to ask him, where have you prepared uh, uh, for the Lord to eat uh, the Passover? And he, he said he'll show you a large room uh, furnished, a large upper room furnished. And he said, prepare for the Passover there. And so they, they did that. The two were obedient, they, which meant they went out, they, they killed the lamb, they, they prepared the, the meal, the bitter herbs, the unleavened bread, and so forth. And then uh, they went and got Jesus. And that's where our verse picks up with the 12. And in addition to him coming to the upper room verse 12 verse 17 then says and at and and in the evening he cometh with the 12 uh, now these uh, 12 were um, the ones that would ultimately of course except for Judas uh, 
become apostles. And uh, you might wonder why Jesus chose 12 of his many disciples to uh, appoint as apostles. And it was uh, perhaps to to be consistent with the old covenant, which was basically given to 12 tribes, uh, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Verse 24, And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Again, the Testament uh, means in this context promise. This is my blood of the new promise, which is shed for many. Uh, and it, 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 it indicates uh, the blood uh, to be that, that is poured off typically, poured out rather typically during an animal sacrifice, uh, most notably during the Day of Atonement. We can see that in Leviticus chapter 4, verse 7. And then, of course, 1 Peter 1, 18, uh, this shedding of the blood is something that they were accustomed to uh, two, but the blood was the blood of an animal, and it, it was shed to atone the sins of the people, to cover the sins of the people. So if we look at uh, Isaiah 53, uh, let's, let's look at the verses 11 and 12. Uh, it, 11 reads, He shall see the travail of his soul, and to be satisfied by the knowledge, by his knowledge rather, shall my righteousness, righteous servant, justify many, for he shall bear their iniquity. Verse 12, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and bear the sins of many and made intercession for their transgressions. When it talks about him being poured out, it's talking about this blood being shared, and it's talking about it being done to be an intercessor, uh, to make intercession for the transgressions of many. So, again, this is the, the first mention of the new custom. New Testament, if you will, or New Covenant, uh, in this verse 24. Where does that? Where do we see that in the Old Testament? As I said earlier, uh, God uh, had planned this other replacement covenant uh, from hundreds from 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 the beginning of of time, if you will. Uh, and actually, we can read about it. What's most the most familiar passage that comes to mind is from Jeremiah, uh, verse thirty-one, chapter rather thirty-one, verses thirty-one to thirty-four. And this was our devotional reading, and it reads very quickly: "Behold, the days come," saith the Lord, "that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, and with the house of Judah." Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, uh, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. Now we'll see in a few minutes that uh, Hebrews uh, repeats that very passage from uh, Jeremiah, but that's where the new covenant was spoken about. And of course, God was talking through Jeremiah about establishing this covenant. You remember Jeremiah prophesied about the Babylonian uh, captivity. Uh, they didn't want to believe it was going to happen, but uh, in fact it did. And uh, he, he was speaking about 
after the captivity, beyond the captivity, at some future time, God was going to establish this new covenant, not the one that they could not keep, but the one that uh, he would uh, place in their inward parts, in their hearts, not the external, but he would actually place his law in their hearts and uh, in their minds. Verse 25, Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more the fruit of the vine, till that day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Now verily again is truly, truly, or this is a solemn invocation. Fruit of the vine, of course, means wine. And of course, this this wine uh, is, this symbolizes an occasion of celebration. And he's saying, I will not celebrate with you. Of course, he knows uh, he is going to be crucified within the next 24 hours. And he is not going to uh, celebrate with them until he does uh, in the kingdom of God uh, with his disciples. You, you recall in the upper room, uh, he says that he is going away to prepare a place for them. And if he goes, he will come again and receive them unto himself, that where he is, there they will be also. And so he's speaking of this time beyond his resurrection when he would and, and and actually beyond their earthly ministry when he would celebrate with them in the kingdom of God. When God's victory is complete and he's gathered all of his people, and we can read about that in Isaiah chapter two, verses one to five, and also Micah chapter four, verses one to five. So what what we have just um, studied, if you will, is um, the pronouncement of the establishment of the new covenant, which was prophesied, as I said, hundreds of years before the first advent of, of the Lord Jesus. Uh, and what we're going to do now is move over to uh, Hebrews and talk about uh, what the new covenant or new promise is and how it is superior to the old covenant. Uh, so let's let's move over to uh, he Hebrews chapter eight, beginning at verse six. Now, before um, we do get into this passage, let me just say a word about Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews. Uh, of course, it, it, it is uncertain who the author was, but most uh, scholars believe that Paul was, but uh, there are others that speculate all over the place as to who the author was. But it was written primarily to Hebrews, and it was basically to answer some questions they had about how their Hebrew faith fit now into into Christianity, into their Christian life. Uh, and uh, some were uh, tempted to go back to the old uh, rituals and old and and, and 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 keeping of the law, uh, and others didn't know that it was consequential at all. Their, their, their the fact that they had been Hebrew and uh, w w had no uh, consequence at all. And 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 what the writer of Hebrews tries to do was to give them perspective on the Hebrew heritage and how what had been presented. Uh, was purposeful, but God had, was good, if you will, but God had provided via the new covenant something better, something superior. Christ was superior to the uh, the priests that ministered for a while, as long as they lived uh, every year. They offered a sacrifice for the Day of Atonement, but Christ gave uh, made a once and final sacrifice for all sins for all time. So, uh, the writer of Hebrews, if you read, if you if, if you're familiar with it, tries to again help them understand how God has provided through Christ and what Christ has done something superior, and we're going to get into this covenant. So verse six says, "But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant." which was established upon better promises. What the writer has uh, explained to this point in chapter 8 
uh, is the sum of, uh, he summed up what he has said uh, through the first seven chapters. Uh, and let me just very quickly read. He says, it's beginning of verse one. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, the true holy place, if you will, which is the Lord, which rather the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. Verse 4, For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for See, for saith he rather, that thou make all things according to the pattern shown to thee in the mount. So the, the bottom line is Moses was instructed to make things that according to a pattern that was in heaven, according to something else. And these things were to be representatives or types or symbols of the true uh, uh, elements, if you will, that were to come. Uh, and, of course, even the sacrificial system, the sacrifice of the lamb, the Passover lamb, was symbolic of the perfect lamb that was to come. So then verse 6 picks up, but now, okay, now the old sacrificial system, the old priest who ministered uh, temporally, uh, these things are, are no longer effective. He says, hath he, that is the Lord Jesus, obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator or uh, of rather a better covenant which was established upon better promises. Now, what is a mediator? A mediator is someone that goes between, someone that uh, that actually connects two individuals or makes uh, reconciles one individual to another. Uh, again, Jesus is the true mediator. He is the true bridge between God and man. We have a relationship with God our Father through Jesus Christ, by our faith in Jesus Christ, and what he accomplished for us on the cross. And he said, this is the better covenant or the better promise. Why is it the better promise? Because it was established on better promises. What are the better promises? Well, better than what? Let's look at the old covenant or the old promise. The Old Testament, and God didn't make a mistake, okay, when he established the old covenant. Uh, one of the commentators said the old covenant was diagnostic. The new covenant or new promise is, uh, is healing, okay, or a remedy, if you will. So the old covenant was given to uh, show us our sin. It was to show us the righteousness of God. And it was to show us how far short of his righteous standards we fell. Uh, it was never uh, intended uh, to save us or to, uh, to uh, be a remedy for sin or a cure for sin. It basically showed us how sinful we were. The new covenant, however, not only shows us our sin, as, as uh, the writer of Hebrews is going gonna, is gonna to remind us of in a few minutes uh, of this new covenant, as, uh, as uh, we read in uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, the laws are placed on our heart. We know what God's righteous standards are, but also because of our faith, we have uh, been given a cure, a remedy for sin, the removal of our sins. We've been cleansed of our sins, which the old covenant could not do. So that is the promise, the better promise of the new covenant. Verse 7, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. 
Look at that in the NIV. The NIV says, For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. Again, we have to understand the purpose of the first covenant. Again, God did not make a state, uh, make any mistake uh, in uh, establishing the first covenant. Uh, neither did Moses or the other prophets that delivered and affirmed it. But uh, the old covenant's problem, again, was uh, by design. It could not rescue people permanently from sin. Uh, it was partial. I mean, it pointed to something greater. And, of course, that greater uh, thing that it pointed to was the new covenant, which not only uh, uh, informs us of our sin uh, and our fallen nature, but it also provides a remedy or a cure or healing for our sin. It is a fulfillment of, uh, it is a it is a fulfillment of God's uh, blessings uh, for mankind, and we're going to see in a minute how it provides uh, the power by which we can fulfill God's purpose uh, purposes in the world in this world, uh, and uh, we're going to refer to John chapter fourteen verses. 12 to 17 and 17, 1 to 5, where God, and we can just address that now, uh, God does, uh, the, the Lord Jesus in the upper room, uh, uh, when he is uh, instructing his uh, disciples, the ones that would become apostles and telling them about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit was going to be in them and how he was going to enable them to do greater works than he did. And then, of course, in his high priestly prayer in chapter 17, we see the, uh, the promises that, that Jesus uh, gives to us, uh, what he asks of his Father. And, of course, what he asks of his Father, his Father provides for us. So we have the power through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to, to, to fulfill God's purposes in us and through us in this world. So let's we're going to jump over to... Uh, verse 10 and actually uh, verses verses 8 and 9 basically did with uh, deal with rather uh, quotations again from uh, uh, from uh, Jeremiah from Jeremiah 31 so we're going to pick up in the uh, in the middle of his uh, quoting Jeremiah at verse 10, which reads, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And a better rendering of that, and, and I shall be to them God, and they shall be my people and um, again that's taken from Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 31 to 34 uh, we know that the original law was summarized in the Ten Commandments uh, called the Decalogue and they were engraved in stone by the finger of God and he's saying no longer Am I going to engrave my laws in stone, but I'm going to put my law on the fleshly tables of their hearts and in their minds? In other words, I'm going to enable them to internalize my laws, my righteous standards, my holiness. I'm going to enable them to internalize. Now, how how does he do that? He enables us to do that, uh, of course, through our faith and through the indwelling of his Holy Spirit, who throughout our Christian walk is involved in the sanctification process and that is uh, uh, basically to shape us and mold us into the very image of Christ and he's saying and uh, so he's going to be our God uh, he's talking about the, the Israelites but we can extend this to every believer he's not just talking about the Israelites. We go by, over to John, as I said, 
uh, chapter 17. And let's do that. In that high priestly prayer, which is the entirety of chapter 17, when the Lord is is uh, praying to his Father. Again, this is just before his crucifixion, uh, right after the Last Supper. When you get down to verse 20, uh, let me let me back up to 19. He says, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Verse 20 says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, and they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Now, so Jesus, uh, this ex- this uh, new covenant is extended to every believer, those who would hear from the apostles and hear from those uh, who, would, uh, who would, would carry the gospel forward uh, 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 if they believed on him, uh, then, then this new covenant applies to, to them as well. And we're going to say a little more about that in just a minute. So verse 11 says, And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Now, what 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 does that mean? You know, um, you know, uh, membership in the Old Testament uh, uh, in Old Testament Israel was primarily through. Uh, the blood. I mean, it was through the bloodline, if you will. It was uh, not. Ex- it was through a covenant relationship that God made with His people, and, and the outward sign of that was in the male, of course, the circumcision of his flesh. But if you were an Israelite, you were considered a part of God's chosen people. Uh, however, and 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 of course. Uh, Families uh, were to instruct their children uh, uh, in the Lord. If we read Deuteronomy 6, chapter 6, to, verses 6 to 9, rather, uh, they were to train them up in the knowledge of the Lord. They were to know about the Lord, about his, his law, about his, his, the oracles of God. Uh, the membership in the new covenant, if you will, to become part of the new covenant uh, uh, recipients of the blessings, if you will, of the new covenant, uh, you have to know the Lord. Uh, in other words, you have certainly have to know the Lord in the pardon of your sin to become a member of that covenant relationship. So when we confess the Lord Jesus as our Savior, uh, we become a part of that covenant, new covenant relationship with him. Now, certainly we are to grow in his word we are to study and we're to grow in our spiritual maturity but we are in the family i mean we are part of the covenant relationship on the basis of our not our our, our 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 believing and knowing the lord as our personal savior and that's what is uh, i believe meant by that we, it's not a question of a person and 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 and, and let's understand this let me back up now, the ancient Israelites uh, could have gone through the motions, uh, the rituals and the feast days and the sacrifices and all that without faith. I mean, without genuine faith. OK, however, it is impossible to be a part of the new covenant without a genuine faith relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, through which we have a relationship with God, the father. OK, and then finally, verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. And then this is finishing up the quote from Jeremiah. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquity will I remember no more. The greater promise, one of the greater promises is the cure, the remedy for sin. What is it? The the removal of it, the wiping it away, the removing of it, as Psalm 103 says, as far as the east is from the west, that is the healing part. Again, the old covenant was diagnostic. 
Uh, you may have heard me say this uh, in the past. I, I mention it often. You know, an example of this is uh, if you were working in your yard and, and and you're planting flowers or whatever and you come in the house and a mirror will show you you have dirt on your face. It will show you your face is dirty and needs to be washed. However, the mirror cannot wash your face. Something else has to wash your face. You need a cleansing agent uh, or some force to wash your face. Well, that that is what the new covenant does. Not only shows us the dirt on our face or our sin, but it washes the dirt away or the sin away. And so I hope we've uh, we've gotten a better understanding of, of these passages. Um, and uh, we do want to recognize uh, that, uh, again, God did not make a mistake in giving uh, the new covenant, uh, the old covenant, I should say. And Jesus said he did not come to um, destroy the law or the old covenant, but to establish it or to fulfill it. And he fulfilled the old covenant by keeping all the righteous standards of the old covenant and then making himself a sacrifice, being the unblemished lamb of God for the rest of us who are all burdened with sins. And that sacrifice was was the propitiation or the satisfaction for our sins. And God, through our faith in what Jesus did on the cross, all of our sins are washed away under the new covenant. So again, I hope that uh, we understand this, uh, these passages a little better. And may God bless you and ever keep you is our prayer.